I'm Bill Butler. I have been practicing archaeology for about 50 years. In the last 20 at Rocky Mountain National Park. Great office. What a place to work. <laughs> One thing that always amazed me is something new was coming up along the line in the world of archaeology. It's delightful that somebody's doing something different. Marilyn is one of those people that has done a lot of this. She grew up in the San Luis Valley, uh, got her BA at Adams State, and then went to uh, Colorado State up in Fort Collins for her master's. Her master's thesis is on culturally peeled trees. These are ponderosa pine trees. The Indians peeled the bark off and went for the phloem, the inner bark. It's starvation food. But we didn't know that until Marilyn did the good research on this and told us about it. She's done a lot of prehistoric archaeology and historic archaeology all over the state, so she's well versed. Her latest thing is the early Spanish sites in the San Luis Valley. We're talking about the, the old Spanish trail. Uh, I don't think you found Danza yet, have you? No, no. Uh, her latest research is what you're going to hear about tonight. And I didn't know what she was talking about when she told me she was working on lithophones. I thought, what, are you, what, 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 who? But the more I worked with her and read the stuff, these are the real thing. It's very important. This is something new, something we have not looked at for a long time. For a we didn't know about. I was talking to her before the meeting, and I wonder how many archaeologists have thrown these things back in the back dirt pile because they don't fit the criteria for pistols or other tools. So anyway, are we ready to roll? We are. Are we ready? I've known Bill for a long time, and I worked for the Park Service when I was in grad school and first met Bill, and I won't tell you how long ago that was, but a few years now. And so it's really a privilege uh, to be introduced by Dr. Butler. So thanks, Bill. And thank you to all of you for coming here this evening to hear this story. It's sort of a unique thing, and hopefully you'll find it's interesting. Many years ago, we identified a number of unique and interesting looking artifacts at Great Sand Dunes National Park in the museum collections, and also some collectors in the San Luis Valley had these artifacts. If you aren't familiar with the area, you can see on this map where the San Luis Valley is and its relationship to Great Sand Dunes National Park. The artifacts that we were looking at are very long, they're carefully shaped, and they're made from stone. For example, the one that you can see on the right here is over two feet long and it weighs about 10 pounds. Some have been referred to in writing or in museum collections or displays as pestles, roller monos, kneading stones, digging tools, hide working tools, and various types of axes. So when we first started looking at these artifacts from Great Sand Dunes, we thought they must be some sort of giant pestle. And a pestle is a grinding tool. You can see two photos on the left there. They're used to crush and grind. I have a small one of those in my kitchen. You may have one too, to crush herbs. But we thought, why would you need something so huge that's 10 pounds to just crush some nuts or something? And then we thought maybe they were some kind of a mono, which is the hand grinding stone that you can see on the right there that was used with a matate, which is the lower piece. And you can grind corn or nuts, or you can pound things with a mono. And we thought, maybe these are just huge monos. But that didn't really make sense either. And what we did is we examined all of these artifacts under a microscope, and we looked at what's called use wear. And the use wear on these was not from crushing and grinding. And so we just said, OK. We give up. We, we don't know because these were not used the way we thought they were originally. So we actually ended up putting them back in the drawers of the museum, but it always bothered me and I thought, what are they? Um, and we just had no idea, but we just put them away for the moment. 
Then a few years ago, a colleague of mine, David Killam, sent me a YouTube video, and I find this is rather amusing, that that's how I figured this out, was from a YouTube video. <laughs> but the YouTube video was this guy in the upper left photo there. His name is Eric Gonthier, and he's a researcher in the Museum of Man in Paris. And they had drawers of these same types of artifacts. You can see in the pictures there that they look very similar to the ones that I have up in the front. And their artifacts had been collected by French soldiers in the early 1900s, and they brought them back to Paris. And of course, nobody knew what they were either. They thought maybe they were pestles, the same as what we thought. But Mr. Gontier was a jeweler, and he had a jeweler's hammer, and he just for some reason decided to tap on them. And when he tapped on them, they played musical notes. And that's when he realized that they were lithophones. So what are lithophones? Litho is Greek for stone, and phone means sound. So a lithophone is a musical instrument that's made from a purposely selected rock, not just any rock, and oftentimes they're highly shaped, like the ones that you can see up here. And when you tap on them or you rub them with friction, they make musical sounds. So that's what a lithophone is. So when I saw this YouTube video, I thought, well, this is crazy because archaeologists in Colorado have never talked about sound as a function for this kind of artifact. Right, Bill? And we've always just thought they were used for crushing and, and grinding. <clears throat> but I happened to have some of the artifacts from Great Sand Dunes at my house that night that I saw the video, and I was returning them the next day to the park. And so I thought, well, what the heck? My daughter is a percussionist, one of them. She had a basket full of these mallets, and so I thought, okay, I'll just try it. And I rang one of them, and I couldn't get over it because they sound like metal bells. And so I thought, well, that's kind of exciting. But I thought, maybe archaeologists, we, we tend to be pretty hard on each other. And if you come up with a new idea, um, people really say, what, what are you talking about? And you get a lot of uh, feedback from them. Uh, but I just thought, this is so interesting. So I talked to the Park Service when I took them back, and I actually played them for some of the park employees, and they couldn't get over it. And so um, they encouraged me to write a grant. And so that's what I did to actually do the initial research, was write a grant um, so I could study these artifacts. What happened to me the first time I played them, I'll just have to tell you a little bit about that story, was I was at home alone, and when I tapped them, I thought, maybe I'm the first person that's heard this in thousands of years. And it, really, it made the hair on my arm <laughs> stand up, because I just thought, wow, this is, this is pretty amazing. So that's the initial story. So there are actually two basic types of lithophones. And I've done a lot of research now, and, re and lithophones are not some new, unknown type of artifact. Now, maybe they are to archaeologists here in, the, in North America, but they're actually well known, and they're found all over the world, including places like Europe, uh, the Far East, Africa, the South Seas, South America, China, and Vietnam. And some have been dated to about five to 6,000 years old or even older than that. So the two types are stationary lithophones and portable lithophones. Examples of stationary lithophones are shown here, including stalactite lithophones from caves in Africa. There are actually some here in the US as well. And some of these <coughs> stalactites have marks on them from being played. And so you can imagine in a cave what it would sound like if you played these. I think it would be fantastic. There are also 
different kinds of lithophones that are huge boulders. Some are called rock gongs. You can see in the, the lower left there and on the right. They're also found all over the world. These are some more stationary lithophones. The one on the top there is stationary now, but it was actually placed in that position. You can see it was placed on the two rocks, and there's some rocks on top of it. And the woman that sent me this photo said she heard it being played and that it was amazing. So it's a giant lithophone. There are also two places in the US that exhibit stationary boulders that have musical properties. One is in Pennsylvania and it's called the Ringing Rocks Park, shown on the left there. The other one is in Montana and it's called the Ringing Rocks and it's on BLM land. And you can go to these locations, you can see the people in the photo there, they have rock hammers and you, you just tap on the boulders and they make sounds. It's pretty fantastic. And if you want to hear it without going there, you can just Google ringing rocks and then look for images or videos. And you can hear them play these boulders. And it's fantastic. These are also some other kinds of portable lithophones uh, that are found all around the world. Some of them are unmodified or minimally modified. And others are really highly modified. Portable lithophones were played in different ways. They could be suspended vertically, like the examples that you can see on the upper left there from Ecuador. Others were suspended horizontally, like the examples from Ethiopia, shown in the center top and the right. And there are some highly modified ones in China and in South Korea. You can see on the bottom there. And those are made of jade. And I'd love to actually try playing those. They look fantastic. And I was talking to a gal about Hawaii. And I had a friend that went there. And he was so excited because he found an article about what are called bell stones found in Kauai. And apparently, they're found in all the Hawaiian islands. They are lithophones that were suspended. You can see the string at the top there. And then on the right are kiva bells, which are a type of lithophone made from unmodified or minimally modified stones. And these were found in pueblos in the southwestern US. And they were supposedly also suspended vertically and then rung. Other portable lithophones were or still are played horizontally like a xylophone. Like the one still played in Vietnam, you can see in the upper left there, this woman is playing these huge lithophones. And I guess they still play them today. And so it would be fantastic to go there and actually see them playing these lithophones. You can actually see her playing them. Uh, there's a video, I think it's a YouTube video. And so just if you search lithophones in Vietnam, you can see her. And she just goes to town on those. And it's fantastic. Some other portable lithophones are played flat on the ground, like the ones in Togo, shown in the right two photos there. They're big slabs of rock. Or the ones in Vietnam, shown in the lower left there, are actually upright. Now, whether they were played in that position or perhaps they were being stored that way, we don't know. Some other types of portable lithophones include very large flaked stone lithophones from Belize that you can see on the left there. And you can see the hand, person's hand, so it gives you an idea of how huge these are. And these were actually shaped by flaking rather than grinding and pecking like the ones that I have here. And on the right is a group of stone artifacts that were also flaked. And they were found in a group, or what archaeologists call a cache. So they were all found together. And they have been interpreted as lithophones as well. Other very large slab lithophones from Cambodia are shown in the photo on the left. 
And I haven't found a recording of that, but it would be fantastic to hear someone try to play these. They're so huge. In 2013, there was an article written in a peer-reviewed archaeological journal that's highly respected called American Antiquity, and they described several portable lithophones from New England that are shown on the right there. They're long and skinny. And the author, who is Duncan Caldwell, noted that lithophones could be a new class of artifacts in most of North America. And as far as I know, no one has ever identified one here in Colorado or in this uh, part of the US. So I was lucky because the Park Service really wanted to know about these artifacts. They wanted us to study them and try to learn about them. And so with their support, I wrote a grant through the Friends of the Dunes, which is a nonprofit organization that works with the park. And we received a History Colorado uh, State Historical Fund grant to study these lithophones that you see here in the photo. And I chose this sample because they're all different sizes and different material types. And I, so I thought it would be a good representative sample. Some are fragments and some have been broken. You can see the lines on some of these, but they've been glued back together. So that's interesting to me because I wanted to see what happened to the ones when they were broken and, and glued back together, what happened to the sound. So for the complete artifacts, the length varied from about nine inches to just over two feet. So the really long ones are these two here, and they're a little over two feet long. There's a lot less variation in diameter. Um, they range from about six inches to nine inches in diameter. And the body shape really kind of varies. You can see in this photo the different body shapes. Some are almost completely rounded. Some are sort of flattened in cross section. Um, it really varies from one to the next. And the ends are also highly varied. If you look at the end shapes on these, you can see some have a point, some are beveled, some are cone shaped, um, but none of them are cut off flat, like a pestle is basically flat or bulbous, but these don't have that same end form that a pestle would have. And the weight of these vary from about two pounds to 10 pounds. So they're, some of them are pretty heavy. 10 pounds, if you're a hunter-gatherer and you're carrying everything on your back, they didn't have horses until very late. So 10 pounds is, is heavy for something that you're carrying that's not food or a weapon or something like that. So to me, that means these were very important. And a lot of people ask me about the material types. We don't know exactly what each material type is. We have some ideas. I've talked to a lot of geologists. The problem is with geologists, they love to see what they call a fresh break. So, you know, they keep telling me, well, if you could just break it. And I said, sorry, we can't. So they have told me they think most of them are um, very dense rocks. They're granites. Uh, they're schists, so some are metamorphic and some are volcanic. It really varies, but they're very, very dense rocks. So when we did our grant, I spent a lot of time with these artifacts, uh, looking at all the peck marks and describing them and measuring things. I took a lot of photographs because I wanted to know how they were made and why they may have been shaped different ways and how they may have been played. So that's why we wanted to spend a lot of time trying to describe these. And I ended up taking top and side view photos. And you can see here how different it looks, this particular one. Here's the top view. But if you see it in side view, the one that's second from the top there, you can see how it's undulating in shape. And we don't know if that undulation is from the original rock form. Was that something that was natural? Or did they make it that way on purpose, perhaps for sound? 
Uh, we don't know. We need to do some experiments to try and figure that out. This particular lithophone is over two feet long and it weighs six pounds. And it's covered with hundreds and hundreds of little peck marks. All those little white marks that you see there, that's where they pecked it to shape it. So these don't look like that when you find them on the ground. We don't know exactly what they look like. But somebody shaped all of these very carefully. You'd have to hit them really hard but not too hard or you'd break it. So if you look at the ends of this particular one, one of the ends is kind of more rounded than the other. A lot of times one end is pointed when you come up and look at these at the end if you want. You can see how the ends can be different on a single artifact. This one, the cross section, is sort of a flattened shape. It's not completely round. And for you musicians out there, this uh, lithophone plays an A sharp and a D when it's tapped. And it's also very resonant when you rub, rub on it. And I'll, I'll show you, I'll let you hear that a little later on. This is another one that's about the same length as that last one. But it's almost round in cross section. You can see how it's not flattened. Um, in the side view there, one of the interesting things, if you look at it from the top, it looks like it's consistent in shape clear across. But if you look at the side view, you can see that it really tapers toward one end. And there's been a researcher who thinks that if you have a really rounded lithophone and you're playing it across your lap or your legs, that you might make it slightly curved or a little bit uh, tapered like that so it doesn't roll off because if you if you try playing these and you move your leg if it's too rounded it, it could just roll so that's one of the ideas of why it could be sort of tapered like that this one also was shaped it's hard to see but there are hundreds and hundreds of little peck marks there where they shaped it and again for you musicians this one plays an F sharp and a G sharp. And as far as the body form, you can see some of them are sort of undulating and curved. There are just three examples in the top photos there. And a basically straight form is shown on the bottom photo. Most of them are either curved or undulating in shape, especially if they're longer. And here's a close up of some of the peck marks. You can see. Each one of these is a peck mark from somebody hitting it and shaping it. So it took a long time to do this. And I'd like to know what they were using to make these marks because they're very small. They're, um, they're just tiny, tiny. When you come up and look at these, you have to look very closely to see the peck marks. But they were pecking it with something really hard because this rock is hard. So what were they using? I don't know. If anybody has any ideas, let me know. Uh, one of my thoughts was maybe a quartz crystal, and you could kind of pound with that because it has a tip on it, and it's also very hard. But we don't really know what they used to shape these. And the one on the right, you can see some of these lithophones have what's called a residue on them. And on this particular one on the right, you can see sort of a reddish area there. And we believe that's ochre. And ochre is a red, yellow, or orange natural pigment that was often utilized prehistorically for ceremonial or ritual purposes. So it could be that they put that ochre on there because these were used for some sort of ceremony. Just to give you an idea of some of the variations on the surface, a lot of them, of course, have these peck marks, but the one on the top was interesting to me because it was also left rough. And what I noticed when I was playing it with friction is it's a lot more resonant because it's rough and it's not real smooth like some of these other ones. So they may have left some of them roughened on purpose if they were playing them certain ways. If you look at the photo on the left there, 
We think this is an impact mark. You can see it's a little lighter colored. And this one is actually this lithophone up here. So if you get a chance and you want to look at it, it has these what look like marks from hitting it. Well, my idea on this particular one, this is where you'd want to play this particular lithophone. So if they were playing it with a hard mallet, like a rock, it might leave these marks. So we were looking for things like that as well. The one on the lower right there has sort of a smooth center to it, but it also, if you look under a microscope, has these striations that go along the length of the artifact. And to me, that might suggest they were using a hard rock as a mallet and striking it in one direction, and it's actually going to leave lines on the lithophone. Some of them also show evidence of being highly polished. That's this artifact right up here. You can see that. It's just amazingly polished. We don't know, again, was that just because somebody wanted it to look beautiful? Or could it have possibly been for sound to make it have a particular sound or maybe uh, more resonant? That's, that's a question I need to ask a lot more musician people, like Mike, who is over here. I'll talk about him pretty soon. Um, but the thing about these lithophones is you need to know about archaeology. You need to know about geology. You need to know about sound, of course. So they're really complicated. And for me, it's been great because I've gotten a chance to communicate with lots of different experts in order to try to understand these rocks. So it's been pretty exciting. These are some marks that we've just found recently. One of these artifacts is up here at the front. And you probably won't even notice it unless you look really carefully. But on the left photo there, there are some pecked zigzag lines that go down the body of the lithophone. And a lot of times, a zigzag line like that represents lightning or something like that. Um, we don't know on this particular one why they put those on there, but it is really interesting. That's another reason why these weren't used as uh, grinding tools, because you wouldn't do that if you were just going to grind with it. On the right is another lithophone that has three pecked angled lines and also some straight lines extending around it. And we don't know what the purpose of these lines was for either. Possibly markings of a certain individual. That's maybe how they decorated their lithophone. Or maybe they had some sort of ceremonial meaning. And I always like to mention this, let you in on sort of an archaeological secret here. Because if we don't know the purpose of an artifact or a certain characteristic, uh, our default explanation is it must have been for a ceremonial or a ritual <laughs> function. Is that right, Bill? Yes. So if you hear me or someone else say that, that means we don't know. <laughs> but it sounds really good. <clears throat> so how do lithophones make sound? The sound travels through a lithophone as sound waves when they're tapped. And it's all based on the physics of sound and how it travels through different materials. So that's another person I've talked to is somebody that knows about physics and how sound works. The sound waves travel in two curves. And they cross each other twice on the lithophone when you're playing it. And where they cross, which are shown by the yellow arrows on the left there, they're called the acoustical nodes, or a simple term is dull zone. And those are the only two spots where they can be held or suspended or laid on a rope, like I have these in the front, or other material without muffling the sound. And these two points, and this is all based on physics, are about 25% of the length of your lithophone, so 25% of the length from each end. 
And it's the same concept as a modern marimba or a xylophone. If you look at the photo on the right there, you can see each of those pieces on a marimba are actually attached at the, the acoustical nodes. And so that's how those instruments work, and that's how these ancient instruments work. So to play our lithophones, we had to figure out where are these dull zones or these acoustical nodes. So first we measured, and just using the laws of physics, we measured on each lithophone about 25% of the total length from each end. And I put a little piece of tape. And when you come up here, you can actually see the little piece of tape. So that's one way to do it. But you can also do it by ear if you pay attention. And so if you're playing along a lithophone, you can actually hear where the sound is dulled when you hit those two acoustical nodes. So if I play along here, can you hear that? There's a dull. It's really loud on the end. Here's the center, that's loud. That's the, the dull zone. So those are the two spots where you can hold them. And I'll show you on one of these. Here's my tape here. If I hold it at that spot, you can hear how loud it is. If I hold it like this, it totally changes it. So that's why in all the photos that you see of lithophones around the world, they're either suspended like this on the two nodes, or they're suspended like this, and that's so they don't dull the sound. And that's why I have them on ropes up here the same way. So the other way, and this is really kind of interesting, is to use what they call the SALT method, and that's what's shown in this particular slide. And it's used in physics classes. If you've taken a physics class in college, you may have had to do this. And it basically is a way to visualize how sound waves work. So you, first of all, sprinkle salt along the length of your lithophone, and that's what's shown in the top photo there and you start playing it like crazy. I had my daughter do this because she was a percussionist and she loved beating on these. Um, you start playing it and what happens is as you're playing it, the sound waves are, they're moving the salt around to the two nodes. That's because the two nodes are where there's less vibration occurring on the instrument. And so when you get to, after you've done it for a couple minutes, this is what it looks like. And your salt is showing you where those two nodes are. And so it's just a way to visualize it. So you can either do it by measuring and knowing physics. You can do it by ear and listening. Or you can actually do it visually with the salt. So once we did that, we pretty much knew how we were going to suspend our lithophones. One of the main tasks we had was to conduct an acoustical analysis, because of course these are musical instruments. And we use software that identifies and records sound characteristics. And these are just apps that you put on your phone. It's great. I have one here. And you can see. That, that's one there showing what note is played. And it tells us the note, the octave, the decibels, and the hertz. And so for each of these lithophones, we recorded that and used the software, which is awesome. Uh, so that made it pretty easy for us, because we're spoiled now that we have these apps on our phones. And what's really interesting is that the lithophones produce two sounds one on the top surface and one on the side. And in many cases, they're different notes, unless they're really flattened. So these are two toned instruments, which I think is really interesting too. So if I play on the top and I play on the side, 
Can you hear the different note? This one's. This one is so. There's one. It's a little bit hard to play with them flat on the table and get the side sound without hitting the, the table. But you can tell they definitely have two, two notes that they play. So it's interesting because they aren't, if you're a musician type, you probably want to know are they the same interval, the top from the side? No, they aren't. Sometimes they play an octave different. Sometimes they're a half step or a step apart. It really depends on the shape of the artifact and the material type. A lot of them also play what are called overtones and that's where two notes play together and when we hear that here in our culture it kind of makes you cringe sometimes and I think that's interesting because sounds like that that are dissonant are actually common in certain music around the world. And so I think the sounds that these lithophones play have some meaning as far as the cultures that we're playing and making these. And just so you can hear how they play the two notes, I'll play this lithophone and then I'll roll it. And what happens is in between the two notes, you'll hear the two notes being played at the same time. And it's that kind of harsh sound This one, I'll try this one. Can you hear where it, it plays two notes like that? It's kind of a, har a harsh sound. And for us, uh, we may not like that, but for certain cultures around the world, their music uses that sound. So I think it's really interesting. And I'll play all of them now so you can hear the different kinds of sounds. Some of them I think sound more like bells, some of metal bells, some sound more like a marimba or a xylophone. So a marimba is made of wood, and so some of them sound a little bit more like wood, like this one. And then others, that one's sort of like wood, but this one sounds a lot like a bell to me. This one, I don't know, is that, I have to ask my musician over here, is that like a xylophone? I don't know. So it really varies, the sound that's produced really varies depending on the rock type and the shape of these. Okay, and then just in general, you can see in the photo how I have them lined up here. Um, they're actually lined up in musical order. So the longer ones play what compared to the, they play a lower note, right? Just like a marimba or a xylophone. So if you look here, I have these lined up in musical order too. They aren't quite um, exactly by length, but in general, the longer ones play a lower note and then the high notes are the short ones. So they're real high piercing sound. And then Okay. And the other thing I was telling you about is how you can play them not just with tapping, but you can play them with friction. It's a little bit different sound. And the ones that are really polished like this one, it's hard to get a good sound, but when they're rough like this one, you can get kind of a ringing, a bell-like sound, like that one. So they can be played tapping or you can rub on them. But here's the key. If you go out into your yard and you look at the rocks in your landscape and you think, oh boy, I've got all these rocks, so maybe I have musical instruments. Probably not, because <laughs> not all rocks 
make musical sounds. So it's only certain types of rocks, not only the type of rock, but the shape. So in general, a lithophone is about four and a half times longer than it is wide to make the best sound. So that's one of the first things. But if it's the wrong rock type, if it's not a dense rock, it will just not make a musical note. This is actually a real grinding stone called a mono, and it's made of sandstone. And so when I tap that, well, you can hear it, right? Yeah. You can hear it, but it's not, it's not musical. So that's the difference. And here's another cobble. This is actually from our yard. And I tried it because I thought, well, I want to see. So um, not all rocks make sounds. So people prehistorically were picking out certain kinds of rocks that had acoustical properties. So what I did when I was trying to study these is I thought I should find mallet types that would have been available to prehistoric folks. So I found different kinds of things like this is just a rock, another rock, it's a hard rock, and it makes good sounds. And this was dinner one night. This was ribs. Uh, and we saved it, but it makes a pretty good sound. And this is antler, and actually this is for making stone tools, shaping stone tools, but you can use it like this, and again, it makes awesome sounds. Um, this bone, I taught some classes in Boulder, uh, at a kid's camp, and they really got, they were having fun, um, and this bone actually started breaking up. But you can just use a bone like this. And then this is just wood. It's a very hard wood, though. This is boxwood. Um, this is another wood called rosewood, and it's very dense, and these make great sounds. So prehistoric people could have made mallets out of a lot of different things. So that, that was no problem for them. Now what I do is I use these mallets. And I got them from Amazon. So we know prehistoric peoples didn't have these. They're composite mallets. And the reason I use these, though, is that they're hard enough that they make a nice sound but they aren't going to change the artifact. In other words, if I use a rock and I hit it too many times, it could start leaving marks. And since these are real artifacts, I don't want to change what they look like. So I use these composite mallets. And that's why you'll see me use these most of the time. And when you come up and you want to try, I'll ask if you'll use these mallets or the wood or something like that. You can see in the photo here, I tried different ways of playing them, just holding them on the upper node there, um, suspending them, just like they did in some of the African photos there. Across the knees, some of the longer ones, you can put them across your knees and play them. And what's great, you just have to think, see, here's the acoustical node, and here's another one. So if you play it across your knees, you just set it on those two dull zones. And again, the other place you can play it is across your ankles, which actually works really well because your ankles are skinnier than your leg, and so you're less likely to muffle the sound. And then, of course, the way I have them lined up here, just on a rope. And that's a really easy way to play them. So of the 22 artifacts that I was studying, they played a minimum of 57 notes, so that's more than two notes each. Some of them play multiple notes depending on where you hit them, and so you can get multiple notes to come out. Um, what's really interesting, are there any musicians out here? I know there's some. They're not saying they are, but if you know a piano, the black keys, 
are the pentatonic notes. And so more than half of the notes of the artifacts that I was studying play uh, notes from the pentatonic scale, which are the black keys on a piano. And that's really interesting to me because um, pentatonic scales in a lot of different forms are some of the most commonly used tonal structure in music found around the world. And I just think that's fascinating that these, what you think are basically simple rock artifacts are playing notes that are found in civilizations all around the world and played by a lot of different kinds of instruments. So one of our questions is where did they get these rocks? I mean if you don't have them in your yard, these people in the past had to go find them somewhere. So where were they getting them? We don't really know. This is a future project, but we have some ideas. The Park Service geologists found me these two rocks right here and they're actually volcanic rocks from the northwest side of the San Luis Valley. And they're big. They're about one and a half to two feet long. They're really heavy. But I set them up on their acoustical nodes, and they actually do play a note. So you can hear that note. Maybe they were played like these Ethiopian lithophones, which are basically the same kind of thing and they just suspended them. Or maybe somebody spent their winters and <coughs> took something like that and made it into one of these smaller ones. Mm -hmm. We don't know. But that's just an idea. So the ones you can see on the bottom there are rocks from stream deposits. And what's really interesting about these is these are lithophones, but they're natural. They are not shaped at all, except by nature. And the guy who found these was a, a percussionist. And he was digging a lot of fence post holes in the San Luis Valley in the northern end. And because he was hearing, you know, he's a musician, he noticed that when he was digging the holes, that sometimes rocks would hit each other and make a sound. And so he'd pull it out and save it. And he did that for about 30 years. <laughs> and he didn't know about lithophones. I ended up telling him about them later. But he called these his singing stones. So this was somebody who just happened to find these on their own because he had a musical ear. And um, so people in the past could have done the same thing. And if you see these that he found, if you look on the right, these are Kiva bells, which are from Pueblos in the southwest. Basically, they look the same. And so here he was finding these just when he was digging fence post holes. These are definitely different than the ones up here because they are unmodified. But they still make sounds in the same way. So one of the most common questions I get is, how did people figure this out in the past? You know, they didn't have physics classes, or they didn't go to music classes, and geology, or they didn't go to college. So how are they going to figure this out? And I thought this was really a great question, but after I thought about it a while, I figured out that it really should be no surprise that ancient people um, figured out that they could make musical instruments out of rocks. And when you think about how people lived in the past, they were part of their environment. You know, they were in it every day of their lives. They didn't just go hiking on the weekends like we do and go up in the mountains. They were there every day. And they really knew the plants. We know that. They knew the plants. They knew the animals. They knew their surroundings, and they knew about rocks because they use rocks for all kinds of tools. So my thought is that people were already using rocks for various things. And so perhaps they were going out to find one of these monos, and they found a longer piece, and they tapped on it to shape it, 
and bingo. They heard this, and if there's a musician, he said, I'll take that because that's not going to be a mono anymore. That's going to be a musical instrument. And that, that to me really made sense. And then I think a great example, I was reading this book. You can see the cover on the left there. It's called The Life-Giving Stone. And it's about Mayan people who still today, in some of the very remote parts of Guatemala, still make monos, the grinding stones, and the matate, the lower piece. They still produce those. And when I was reading about this, I thought it was really interesting because here's their mono, which looks sort of similar to these lithophones. And what they do is they quarry them first. You can see on the right here. And then they get these rough cut monos, and they take them back to their villages. And the first thing they do before they spend more time shaping them, what do you think they do? They tap on them, and they listen to a sound. And if they make a certain sound, they'll keep them. If they make a different sound, they toss them, because that means they have some sort of flaw, and it's not worth you know, spending hours trying to make a nice shape. And when I thought about that, I just thought perhaps that's the kind of thing that happened and how lithophones may have been created. You know, somebody was doing something else, but they, were, they wanted to hear the sound, and what if it was a great sound? There you go, you might have a lithophone. So those are just some ideas on how possibly lithophones were started. And I think this probably happened thousands and thousands of years ago. This is a picture of the guy I was mentioning who's the percussionist in the San Luis Valley, Jeff Shook. And you can see he has shelves of these. These are natural lithophones and that he calls singing rocks. And I went to visit him and I showed him how to lay them out on a, a rope so he could get a good sound out of them. And he's actually really good at playing these lithophones. What he told me that I thought was really interesting, he said, it's only about one in a thousand rocks that has acoustical properties. So you really have to spend a lot of time or get lucky to find these rocks that make musical sounds. But again, I think this recent example of someone finding these Lithophones, just because he happened to be a musician, um, shows that it could have easily happened many thousands of years ago to prehistoric folks. And in case you're interested and you want to hear him play, Jeff Shook actually gigs with these in Salida. So you can try to find him, and you may find him playing his lithophones. So these are some of the new technologies. We haven't had time to really figure all this out. But if you've ever heard of XRF or X-ray fluorescence, it's one of the technologies that you can use to figure out things. It's almost like magic. I took the lithophones down, and they use this machine that you can see right here. They just hold it up to the lithophone, and it tells you it's non-destructive, but it tells you the elements that are in the rock. And so this is really fantastic information. It may tell us where these came from, what the source areas are. It may give us information about which of these play certain sounds or which are more resonant, and what's the element, what are the elements that make up those particular rocks. So there's a lot of new technology out there that I think is worthwhile to try and research and maybe some young person uh, can take this forward. Uh, there's a lot of research still to be done. This is another idea. This is 3D modeling. And if you've ever seen a 3D model, you can, on the computer, you can turn it all around and see different parts of it. Um, my daughter, that's her arm there, She's at CU, and she got permission to go in, and we actually did a 3D model of one of the lithophones just to try it out. And the reason I think that's important is because it may help us understand the acoustics if we can really look at the shape and look at 
the shape in different directions. And then also a lot of these lithophones I borrow from a museum and I give back. So then I don't have them anymore. So if we can use 3D modeling, it's a way to record these and have that information so we can study them in the future. So we've learned a lot about these, but I think there's a lot more work to be done. When I started, I think I had maybe five or ten questions, and now I have pages of questions, which is great, and I think that's the way science should work, is that you should study things and always come up with new questions. And I think that's great because you don't want to think you know everything because you never will, but that's okay. That's how you're learning. And so some of the questions that we have still include how were they used by hunter-gatherers who were people that weren't living in villages like Pueblos? How did they use lithophones versus someone that was living in a village like Mesa Verde or something like that? Um, what are the dates of use? We have one date on an artifact that I studied, and it's about 6,000 years ago. But what are the other ones date? Uh, could the long, long ones be older? I mean, we just don't know. So we still have a lot of research to figure out how old they are. And how far back do they go in Colorado versus other parts of the U.S.? We just don't really know that. And was their use related to here we go, ritual or ceremony? Um, or was it more of a personal enjoyment? Um, just like we enjoy music today for pleasure? Or could it have been used just uh, an everyday thing like sort of a dinner bell, you know? Your mom rings the lithophone and you come and eat. I mean, we don't really know, but those are some of the questions that we still have. And how were they made and played? Again, we don't know what these look like before they shaped them. So we have lots of questions about where the rock came from and how did they shape them and why did they shape them certain ways. Um, and what can the sounds, because this is all about music, so what can the sounds tell us about the cultures and the people that made these? And I think that's really important. It's going to be hard to figure that out, but I think we have to ask those questions. I also think, if you're an archaeologist, that there are a lot of lithophones around in museums or may have been found in archaeological contexts, but they haven't been recognized as lithophones. Because just like the ones that we were studying, people thought these were grinding tools. And so there are a lot of museums out there that have col huge collections. And I've been working with uh, the History Colorado Museum in Denver, and I have four lithophones up here that they did not know they had. They had no idea. In fact, they were thinking of deaccessioning them because they don't have good provenience, which means good lo locational information, but now, after I got a chance to tap on them and we realized they're musical instruments, they are going to keep them and they want to know more about them. But I think there are other museums, I'm sure there are, and I'm working with a few others that have these and they don't know it. And so the only way you can try it, you can look at these, but the only way to know is to play them. So that's, that's a big um, job for me, keep me busy when I retire. My husband's back here. So uh, he's a musician, by the way, so, uh, so he understands. But uh, just as an example, I was reading an old journal, and this on the left there, there was a cache or a group of 12 of these artifacts, and they were found by a well-known archaeologist here in Colorado, Dr. Joe Ben Wheat. He was at CU. You may have heard his name. And he described these. They were found in a little niche in the wall of a, a house, house pit. <clears throat> and he thought maybe they were digging tools, and he didn't know what they were. And then I read further in his little uh, article, and he said, I don't know what they are. We'll just figure it out later. And so now I really want to go see if this, ex this group exists 
because it would be fantastic to find a group of them that were probably made to play together and try playing them. So uh, we'll have to see if the museum hopefully didn't throw them out, but that would be some of the future research that we might want to do is find something like this. Unfortunately, ground stone artifacts, um, archeologists spend a lot of time looking at what we call projectile points or spear points. I'm sure you've seen them in museums and, and they're amazing, they're beautiful. But ground stone is always, people in the past always said, oh, it's just ground stone. You know, they were just grinding stuff. And so sometimes they were even not collected on sites, <clears throat> which makes me sad now when I think about it. Um, but I'm, I'm pretty sure they excavated this site, so they did collect all these artifacts. So I'm hoping they're still there and nobody threw them away. And if you look on the right, there are a couple of artifacts that have been called by archaeologists a celt or an adz. These are thought to have been for cutting or chopping. And I actually have these two up here, but they play beautiful sounds also. So were these actually multi-purpose tools? In other words, somebody used it for cutting, and then they could also use it as a lithophone. We don't know. But I think it's, it's one of those things where we need to question everything. At least that's my idea, is think about sound for all kinds of artifacts and just check it out because you'll never know until you tap on it. And so that's what I've been doing and I have this celt and ads up here as lithophones also. Here's another example. If you've been to the San Luis Valley at the north end, there's a little town called Swatch. They have a little local museum and they have a case, they have lots of points in cases. Uh, but they had this long artifact in there, and it was called a kneading stone, is what it was labeled. And it took me 10 years to convince the people who were running this museum to allow me to temporarily take it out and try playing it. And so when we finally got a chance to do that, we took it out, and this is what it looks like. And of course, it looks just like these lithophones. And when you play that one, it sounds just like a metal bell. So it was very exciting, and they were excited also because they had no idea that that's what it was. So again, I think these are the kinds of things we need to do in the future. And one of the big questions we have is how and where these lithophones were played in the past. You know, were they usually played just individually? I have these all lined up, but these actually came from different places. They weren't found together. So in most cases, was it just an individual? They just played it? Um, or were individuals that had lithophones, did they get together and have a rock concert? Um, <laughs> that's kind of what I think. Um, yeah, yeah, get st <laughs> That could be too. But, you know, that is what I kind of imagining happening, especially at Great Sand Dunes, because we found so many lithophones out there in the sand, and a lot of them, especially, the, there's one big one that's about two feet long, and it was actually found upright stash, and we think it was probably left that way on purpose. And if you're ever at the sand dunes <coughs> and the wind blows, you know what ha would happen if you laid your lithophone down and thought you'd come back next year and find it. You will never find it. And so we think that one that was found upright was probably left that way on purpose. So that even if the wind blew a lot, you would still find it there the next year. But there were a lot found around this one spring so was that a place where maybe people gathered and played the lithophones? I don't know. Um, we don't know. We know there have been some groups of lithophones found where it looks like they, they made a group of them to play, sort of like a marimba or a xylophone. 
And this particular article was really interesting to me. It's a newspaper article that came out in 1953, and it discusses a find of kiva bells, which are the natural lithophones that were found in a uh, pueblo in New Mexico. So 23 of these, somebody probably had them laid out on a table and were playing them. And we don't really know what the scale, what were the notes, but I think that would be really important. Again, I would love to go see if this still exists, this group of lithophones, because if you're a musician, to understand the scale and all the notes that a group of them would play would be fantastic to understand. The other thing that I'm really interested in is where were they playing these? Could they have been played in certain locations? We know that the stalactites were played, of course, in a cave, but could lithophones also have been played in places like caves, or have you ever been in a canyon where you can yell yes. and you get an echo? And so I was thinking about that too. There's some places at Great Sand Dunes where you get these amazing echoes. And I was thinking, could people have intentionally played lithophones where you have the echoes? Because that would be sort of magical, I think. Uh, there are also rock shelters, you know, sort of not real caves, but sort of a small cave. And if you go into one of those and you speak even, Sometimes it amplifies your voice. And so I'm just wondering if they may have chosen places where the sound was either um, altered, where it was echoing, or maybe it was amplified in some particular way. But those are the reasons why we'd like to find lithophones in their original position if, if we get lucky. So that's sort of my goal is to get archaeologists to think about this when they're out in the field and think about sound when they are finding artifacts. This is something that was just sent to me recently, and I find it it's really intriguing. These two artifacts in this photo are called stela, and they were found in a looter's pit at the top of the Pyramid of the Sun at Teotihuacan. If you know where that is, it's in Mexico. And so it's a huge pyramid. And they're made of a green schist, which is known to have acoustical properties. But what's really interesting, it's too bad there's not somebody standing there, but the bigger one on the right weighs 2,000 pounds. Wow. So the heaviest one I've studied weighs 10 pounds, which I thought was heavy. But this is uh, 2,000 pounds. And so I'm just wondering, I had a guy who actually said, hey, could these be lithophones? And I thought, wow, that would be fantastic. And if you read the sign in this exhibit, this is an exhibit that was brought up from Mexico and it was uh, being shown in uh, Arizona. And it says the function of these two stela are unknown. And I thought, wow, I would love to play that, um, but we don't know, you know, of course, is it a, actually a lithophone? But it looks very similar to a lot of the lithophones that I've studied, only huge. So again, I think it's just something to think about that we need to consider sound more than we have in the past. If you don't know what it is, think about sound as a possible function. These are some other ones that could possibly be lithophones. These are actually flaked. They look like a spear point. That's what people might call them. But if you look at the little hafting marks, so usually these little marks are where they would haft it to put a handle on it, right? Yeah. But they're so small and they're too far toward the end to put a handle on. They don't make any sense. And if you read about these, researchers are often talking about the hafting. They just don't make any sense. So why'd they put those so close to the end there? Well, um, a researcher who was working with lithophones thinks that these hafting, those little notches, were probably for suspending them as lithophones. And I gave a talk to the New England Antiquities Association, 
And I mentioned this because these are from, most of these are found in the northeastern part of the country. And so he had one, and after I gave the talk, he actually tested one of these and sent me a video, and it was unbelievable. It sounded like a metal bell. Wow. So, you know, just another idea that some things that we think, just by looking at it, you think, oh, that must have been a spear point. Maybe they weren't. So just kind of taking a second look at things. Now this one in the oval there is, is actually a lithophone. It's over four feet long, and I like to call it the mother of all lithophones <laughs> because it's one we know is actually a lithophone. And supposedly, this is in a small museum in Truth or Consequences, New Mexico, if you know where that is, T or C. Um, there's another smaller one next to it. I don't know if that one is a lithophone or not, but it was supposedly found with the mammoth skull. Now, whether that's true or not, we don't know for sure, but if it was, could that mean that lithophones could go clear back to um, the earliest people who were inhabiting North America? So that's a great question. We need to know more, obviously, but it's just something to think about. To wrap this up, because everybody's been very patient, um, we have a lot of questions. And I think we have a few answers, and we have a lot of places that we need to go to, to uh, find out more about lithophones. But I think after studying these lithophones, what it's meant to me is it really brought a more um, humanity, more humanity to people who lived in the past. Because when you think about music, music is really an expression of all humanity. And music is considered to be the universal language. I love that idea because I think that's not only today, but I think that is from yesterday as well. So music can reach you in a lot of different ways. I think all of us probably like some kind of music today. And I think that people in the past probably thought music was important also. And the fact that people were creating these complex musical instruments out of rock, I think that means something. Not only were they doing that, but it means that they didn't just spend all their time trying to live you know, survive. It meant they were doing other things for pleasure or for other reasons, spending a lot of time making a musical instrument. That isn't gonna give you food, right? But it's important. It must have been important or they wouldn't have done it. So I think that's one of the important things that I learned and I've thought about with these musical instruments is that people were spending a lot of time doing this when it wasn't something just for survival. And I think that's really significant. So that's it for me. And I'd like to thank the Niwot Historical Society and Channel 8 as well for hosting this and for bringing me here. I really appreciate it. And you can see all these people up here, the Park Service, the Friends of the Dunes, the State Historical Fund. They helped um, give me a little money so I could survive while I was studying these artifacts. But it takes a lot of people to actually do some research like this. And so I really appreciate everyone that supported this, this research today. So thanks.